everyone, and welcome to this expert panel about translation quality management. This event is brought to you by Wordbee, the makers of the Wordbee translation management system and Catsul, and it's hosted by my colleague Robert Rogge and myself, Tanya Falkner. On today's panel, we'll be talking with experts about scaling translation quality, about challenges of quality assessment. Uh, we'll also talk about the role of the, the, the role that technology plays and a whole lot more. So for our listeners, if you have any questions during the panel or comments, you can write them in the chat box that you can find on the right hand side of your screen and we will try to address them as we go. Cool. Uh, so we're super excited to welcome our four panelists here today, uh, our four experts. Uh, namely, we've got uh, Kirill Soloviev of Content Quo. Uh, we've got William Spalding of WeWork fame. Uh, we've got uh, Elena Brandt uh, from uh, Middlebury Institute of International Studies mm -hmm. in Monterey. And uh, we've got Baz O'Reilly of uh, Keywords and uh, Linebridge uh, fame. Uh, so uh, why don't you guys take a moment to uh, introduce yourselves, um, you know, talk about what you've been doing lately and what, what, what you're working on or have done lately. Elena, you want to start? Yeah, I sure can. Um, my name is Elena Brandt. I am an assistant professor of professional practices in the translation and localization management program at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. I teach localization project management, uh, vendor management, terminology management, quality management, and I also practice on the private market with Culture Flipper as a localization project management expert. Cool. Thanks. Um, so let's uh, move on over to Baz. Hi everyone, um, Baz O'Reilly. I've uh, I worked in LQA um, with keywords from uh, being an English tester to a lead to a project manager and to the uh, service delivery manager there. So um, quite a long history of, of working within games in the LQA space. Uh, and I moved to Linebridge briefly as a, a senior project manager for localization as well. So um, I'll, I'll probably focus mostly on uh, my experience within games. And if you hear me say we, it's because a piece of my heart is, is still at keywords, but uh, I, I, I should probably note that I, I'm not here to represent them. And uh, you know, if I say anything offensive to anyone with keywords, I, I'm deeply sorry. <laughs> cool, right on. <laughs> um, so, uh, William. Hi everybody, um, my name is William Spaulding. I use he, they pronouns. Um, I'm a localization program manager formerly with uh, WeWork, currently seeking opportunities. I've also served on agency side with We Localize and, and um, was a program manager with Cisco Systems, a global technology services org. Um, I have experience working with a lot of LQA processes and testing programs as well as just quality management and, and the subjectivity of that. So um, yeah, excited to be here, thank you. Cool. Great to have you. And Kirill, you're the go going clean up here. The last but not the least, right, as they usually say. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kirill Soloviev. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Contempo. We're a translation technology company headquartered out of beautiful Tallinn, Estonia, Northern Europe. And we work with some of the companies that have been named earlier here to help them streamline how they manage translation quality in games, in government organizations, in large LSPs, and so on and so forth. My focus is first and foremost on linguistic quality, so more part of the translation workflow. Although in my past career as a director of localization, I used to work with LQA quite a bit as well. So both topics are very, uh, very near and dear to my heart, and I hope I can cover uh, both of them today. Great. Thanks, guys. All right. So let's jump straight in. Um, I guess our first question, you know, since we talk about quality, would be how would you guys define quality? And also, more important, I guess, who gets to decide what quality really means? I'll start. Um, quality, I define uh, according to standards. Um, as the ability to make, meet the specifications that you've set out at the beginning of a project. So this is 
something that um, those who work with like ASTM F43 and ISO TC37 are very clear that when it comes to being able to define quality, since quality is so subjective, that it's about first identifying, okay, for this specific client, what does quality mean? Documenting that at the start of the project and then passing through the project, collecting data as you go in order to be able to, at the end, identify and measure, did we actually meet the objectives that we set out to meet in um, providing services to this client? What's interesting about that is it's the ability to meet client's um, objectives and at the same time, so we're kind of, we're putting the onus on clients to establish what quality is, but a lot of times clients don't know what quality is. So it's that double-edged sword that we have where it's like, okay, you have to meet the client's expectations, but the clients don't know what their expectations are. So we as professionals have to have really strong specifications at the beginning of the project and establish all of the different parameters so that we have a, a good path to follow and move forward in order to achieve quality at the end. Mm -hmm. I think yeah, Elena I would summarize very well. I just wanted to add my two cents. So this is the perfect academic definition. And uh, what makes me super happy is that in Content Pro's work, we actually started to see companies use that kind of approach. So they, they define what is the ideal quality, which aspects of translation quality are more important or less important. And then they check throughout their localization process that what they have created, what they have translated actually complies to those requirements or specifications. Uh, I honestly wanted to say, uh, I would never live to see the day when people are working with translation specifications, but something like that is actually happening. And we're very happy to see that, you know, both the LSP side of the market and the buyer side of the market, both commercial ones and government ones are finally moving in this direction. So great definition, Elena. And I can just support that this is something that we've seen to uh, emerge as a best practice in this industry after all those years of waiting. Yeah, I think I can uh, echo those sentiments as well, but maybe just add an extra little layer at the top, especially if we're talking about games or something in the creative space that ultimately the quality will will probably be defined by the, the end user. And um, I know that's not exactly um, going along uh, perfectly with what we're saying, but um, you know that, that might define how we do the next project or, or how we move things forward uh, you know, for, for someone who's setting up as, a, as the new client and how they set their standards will be based on how people saw the past projects that came through. Absolutely. Yeah, and I would uh, echo everybody else as well. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, on, on our end, oftentimes the end user does define the quality, particularly when it comes to the UX or their experience working with the product. Um, and, and so from an organizational standpoint and a client standpoint, it takes a lot of effort to get local insights and, and that understanding uh, to be able to define the quality for that region. I wanted to uh, recall something that I was talking about last week. So uh, we've done another panel about machine translation quality, but I think w what we've talked about there applies very much to a general context as well. Uh, so there are basically like three layers when it comes to quality. And what Bas was saying was that the end user or the reader of your content or the player of your game is the ultimate arbiter of whether you've done it well or not. So they will engage with your game if the quality is high enough. They will buy your product online in your e-commerce store if they understood the descriptions and were enticed by them. And they will have a good experience using your software, will actually get their job done. <laughs> There's a bit of a problem with that thing though. Very hard to figure out what they've actually done, what they feel right, and what kind of experience they have. So we kind of have to have something else in our translation process, right? That kind of tries to mimic or approximate or predict what will be happening when we show this localized piece of content to the end user, right? So we always have those two sides, this interplay between the, what we call the outcome of translation quality um, outcome-based metrics and those production level metrics that we can actually measure ourselves before we publish this stuff 
to the gamers to the end users so yeah uh kind of trying just to be conscious of those two sides here and make sure that we all understand it's not enough to only work with end user experience it just takes too much time to figure out is it good or bad and by the time it's usually hard and expensive to fix so you kind of have to have both of those worlds covered and i was yeah, that interrelatedness is important and sorry william were you going to go on no 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 i was just making a brief comment yeah go ahead okay um, I was going to say, I think it's really interesting you're talking about the end user being the arbiter to or uh, the person who's ultimately making the decision about what is the quality, because oftentimes, unfortunately, and I guess I shouldn't say, say oftentimes, but clients are not establishing their specifications with end users in mind. So you think about localization these days where, where customers are demanding, they're demanding a product that is localized to them specifically. And then you think about cases where, let's say, like a universal Spanish is asked or requested by the client. I, I just like that does not appeal to a, a, a local Spanish speaker in uh, one of the 23 or 24 markets that speak Spanish. Yeah. And so this and I think this is a demand that we're seeing more and more from from consumers that no, we want it to be local. So I think clients really need to get the message that, hey, you're not going to be able to get away with like a universal Spanish that covers the entire globe and every single you you gotta you gotta pick an audience and gear to that audience. But then with the game space too, I'd be super interested with that game space too because you've got end users then. And Baz, I, I guess this would be kind of a question for you with the end users where the end users are kind of establishing some of the content in some cases when it comes to games, right? Like on forums or I'm just thinking about the expectations of users when they're using a product too and how that's that's built in. Yeah, and, and actually that kind of goes along with what you were saying initially about how there has to be different levels of quality according to um, clients or different specifications. I mean, we, we have to recognize that Candy Crush isn't the same as Assassin's Creed or Pro Evolution Soccer or that kind of thing. And um, when it comes to uh, the likes of Pro Evolution Soccer, they're going to be up against maybe waiting for reviews to come out. Some of the players will wait to see which reviews are better between PES and FIFA, and then they'll buy that one, you know? Um, so it can come down to very specific things uh, based on what the community are saying. And that's even more of a trend, I suppose, with, with online mobile games um, where there's, um, there's releases for you know festivals and periodic releases every month or every every time there's there's something new coming up. So you actually, um, if you're releasing a, a huge game and it's kind of a, a one and done in the old style, where you would just do the whole process and release it and you buy the game and you play it, um, you don't really have the option to go and fix it. You you your next game is where you have to fix it or maybe you can improve some things in in DLC or whatever. But the likes of uh, of an online mobile game that, that has new releases all the time, maybe you can address some of those issues more. Um, and that seems to be certainly more of a trend. Um, I, I don't know, even, I don't know if it relates to localization so much, but like, Snakes on a Plane was, was one of those that uh, I think uh, was, was massively influenced by the, the community and, and we're seeing certainly more of that um, with, with gaming. I wanted to latch on uh, to what Bass was just saying, and also, you know, in regards to what Elena was saying. It was just this perfect story I heard. Uh, I think this was at Lock World a couple of months ago from Electronic Arts, specifically about how they use the uh, the in-country player feedback to um, revisit certain aspects of localization quality. So uh, their example was actually really cool because it shows us that quality of localization is not just about the quality of text. Um, Baz, you might have been involved in that project yourself, so tell me if you know more juicy details. They were talking about a Dutch version of FIFA, I think, and the, the, the narrators or the, the people who comment on those matches in the Dutch version, basically their voices were not very well received by the uh, Dutch fans of FIFA, the game. And uh, when uh, the localization and the data teams have discovered this negative sentiment, so the players were not happy with the quality of Dutch localization, specifically when it comes to the voiceover and to the talents that have been picked to do this voiceover. 
And in the next version of FIFA, they actually replaced those voice talents and immediately the player sentiment has gone up. So they managed to also take in this end user, the player feedback, apply it creatively to solve a difficult quality problem and, and they've succeeded. So their positive reviews have basically went through the roof once they've done that. So yeah, there sometimes is a way to bring those worlds together. But like Bash was saying, if you don't ship your product or your content every week or so, <laughs> you can only react to this feedback only so often, right? It's only a couple of years for a major release. And this is also why usually companies want some proactive way to keep an eye and a hand on what's going on there and localization before they get the in-country user or player feedback before they need to wait for another two years to ship a fix to that. So yeah, that's how it usually goes. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, I'd like to uh, piggyback so, on that as well. Yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, I just oh, wanted I to say, yeah, I think, you know, it's really important for you. So yeah, you go. I love that. Uh, oh. Yes, so um, at, at WeWork, we, you know, the end user feedback was really important. Can can you all hear me? I think I'm getting some latency issues. Right now, yeah. You can hear me? Okay, cool. Um, so so the ambassador program was something that we deployed um, for, for in-market insight uh, by internal stakeholders. Um, and it was really for our marketing language um, and 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 content that we were, we were selling our, our space through. Um, getting ambassadors of the brand um, in region who are native to, to the markets that we are um, marketing in, uh, reviewing our content and, and signing off on it or providing suggestions. And we, we put in a feedback loop so that their, their comments or edits or feedback could always loop back to the linguists and continue to build and hone style and tone and, and that, that um, more subjective um, use of language that, that we're looking for. Um, and it was quite successful. So um, I don't know if anybody has worked with it's, you know, just a subject matter expertise review essentially, but more um, automated and, and baked into our localization process, uh, which was quite successful and it worked well, um, though there were, were also challenges around it too. I think William really had um, the spot here. So the, this concept of Continuous feedback is crucial to modern understanding of translation quality, right? Because the specifications Absolutely. that Elena has begun with are actually not static, so they tend to change, but they are also not clearly cut, right? What we usually see both on LSP side and on buyer side is that it's rather like a direction or priorities that the teams are able to define but the, the nitty gritty of what constitutes a great translation or the right level of quality is only shared through this continuous, small, lower level feedback that goes on day to day, day in, day out for all the languages, all content type, of course, prioritized properly, categorized, you know, collected and analyzable, but still, right, this continuous aspect of quality is what really got me going in what William was saying. This is basically the yeah. only way to get to, you know, the, the process to meet the requirements you have. It's uh, it's not like and producing physical objects where you can just specify, you know, a set of dimensions, a color, and then expect the results to perfectly match with those requirements. Translation is a bit more complex than producing nuts and bolts, right? So this is why this iterative process is an absolute must. Every organization we talk to, everybody who has kind of mastered quality, right? That's what we hear from them. Okay, we already do this. How can you guys help us do it faster or cheaper or smoother? But the core is always the same, so continuous improvement. Absolutely. That feedback, uh, that feedback loop was really critical, and it's also always a debate. You know, um, language is subjective; people speak it differently. Um, the linguists wouldn't always agree with the ambassadors, and then they would have to, you know, debate on that and and come to common ground and and finding that balance of what what was linguistically accurate, but also met the needs of the the brand and the end user. Mm -hmm. It's great terminology that you're using. I love that ambassador terminology. 
just because it, it, that's just really great terminology. I love this discussion too on continuous feedback because I think a, a, a thing that happens sometimes in localization is that we get these tools. So we get the academic side of things, right? We get a typology like the MQM typology, which is a collection of, it's a typology of translation error types um, developed by um, some of the folks in ASTM F43. Um, and so that is a collection of 200 errors that a person could go through when they're reviewing a translation and they could identify, okay, and you wouldn't identify all 200. You wouldn't say to an editor, here's a list of 200 error types, go through this 300 word translation and, and you know, categorize all of these 200. You would pick a subset. But even once you have that subset of error types, what I, I think kind of the thing that organizations, um, maybe this is where there's a little bit of disconnect is it, there's this idea that you can just pick the subset and oh, there you go, we've got our subset, we've got the error types that we wanna look for. But then it's a matter of within your organization, harmonizing the understanding of what is the definition of that error type specifically for our organization. And that's a process that takes time. That's a process that takes, when you onboard a new translator, they need continuous, like, I mean, I would have a probationary period of like three to six months where it's continuous feedback where you have somebody, an ambassador who is behind that new translator who understands the voice and brand from having had the opportunity to, um, through case studies of work they're doing for an organization, build an understanding and definition in their mind. Oh, this is what this kind of error means for this company. It's only once you have that harmonized understanding of what is this specific type of error that you can start collecting data on, um, on translator performance. And the thing is too, when thinking about sort of collecting data on translator performance, if you have evaluators applying a typology like the MQM typology inconsistently, all of the data produced from that is worthless, right? If you've got one person thinking that this error is this thing and one person thinking it's this thing, and it's what happens. We've done a lot of tests and we, uh, with the MQM error typology over at the Middlebury Institute and evaluators who have no previous experience with the typology, they apply it inconsistently. So you definitely have to take the time to build a, a harmonized understanding within an organization of what a specific error type is. Right. Uh, that's exactly what we see uh, at Contempo yeah. actually. And uh, some of the best teams that we are, were lucky to work with, they have actually nailed this very, very well. So this process of aligning the expectations of all the players in this, you know, uh, in this content creation chain, including the translation team, the team that does your in-country reviews, the team that evaluates how well the in-country requirements have been matched, assigned and scores at translations and so on and so forth. Uh, and I think the, the basis for solving the challenge that Elena was talking about, so uh, this different perception of different aspects of quality by different people, solved in exactly the same way. Continuous feedback, what is the right process, right? So let's say you have too many people taking decisions on what's good and what's bad, right? You need to smooth it out somehow. So most organizations that Content Quo works with, they actually have a two-step process. They have the first round, somebody considers if it's fit for purpose or not, annotates and categorize the errors, let's say. But then another more senior person would actually go through what they've, what they've found and gives them feedback, helping not just the translation team to address the, the issues, but also the team in charge of making this quality decision aligned to the single perception, single view of what a good quality translation is, right? And we haven't seen any other way or they don't work, right? It's only by layering the process and getting, you know, human intelligence in the loop. And of course, automating certain things that are tedious, you can actually do this sort of thing at scale. There's just no other way that we've seen, at least not yet. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And Elena, I want to say regarding the ambassador terminology, I have to give a shout out to Alexandra Sess. Uh, she's currently with Twitter, but she was the quality manager that that really built that program. And Kirill, to your point too, is um, well, first defining that subset was was critical. We needed to know what kind of an errors, what kind of errors we we felt were important, and what those right. looked like for us. Um, and then assigning as we onboarded new linguists or vendors. Um, 
yeah, assigning a more senior editor or vendor to to uh, that was familiar with our work and had helped us build those subsets and define these things. Um, grooming and and providing that continuous feedback through a review process, um, absolutely essential, I think. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, really it's creating interrelatedness and constant uh, communication paths for people. Yeah, I think that definition is is ultimately really, really important. It's it's just to give it a kind of a, a really basic analogy. It's like the five star film review. You know, you have to know what each star means. Is is, is a three star a movie that I should go and see, or is that a zero? And then we have like two and one is a negative one and negative two, or you know, and a plus one and a plus two on the other side. So as long as everybody understands from the outset what that rating is and, and given that standard definition really uh, allows you to to provide it. and i think that's that's the issue that you have at scale with for you know working with lqa it's kind of a gig economy it's project types and that brings in some of the difficulties is making sure that you you know you have 200 people working and that they all understand in the same way uh, and you've got a high turnover and you've got to get the next 50 people in the next mm -hmm. two months to un understand that and it's, it, it becomes so crucially about your your kind of base of people who really have this understanding and the ability to get other people on board and, and to drag them along with, uh, with with what becomes the kind of culture and does the creative nature of games and the creative nature of the text does that um provide uh, difficulties of 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 its own you think in terms of quality management is that directed to me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I think you're I, in the I more mean, creative space of of, uh, of the panelists. I mean, I kind of in a sense, yes, but we're also at the end of the the language. So, I mean, if if you're getting your testers to to fix your language, like something's gone wrong at that point. So, um, when when you're looking at LQA, um, language is one of kind of many features of the of the skill set that the person uh, needs to have. Um, it's it's probably the most important one, but um, it's still just one of of many qualities that it takes. I mean, um, I, I think we were we were Carol gave a, a, an example earlier on about Dutch in FIFA, but I saw one earlier on where um, it was a Japanese game and there was a free trial, um, and they couldn't understand why nobody in Europe was taking up the free trial. And what it had turned out was the way that they had displayed it in the menu was all the expensive ones were at the start and the free trial was listed at the end of the menu. Whereas in Europe, they were like, okay, it's 10, it's 20, it's 30, it's just going up and they never scroll to the end. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just an expectation based on the culture. So even just in, in terms of those, like localization is, is it's not just language. Um, so yeah, it's it's a creative space, uh, but for LQA, you're kind of at the, the end of that. And I would say that the, the content creators uh, would have already gone through that and, and kind of had more of an impact on the creativity before it would get to our stage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I wanted to echo what Buzz was saying. At Content Quo, we actually work a lot with gaming companies and, and we have a we see a huge difference between the ones that have a solid LQA process and the ones who maybe don't have it yet. Uh, generally speaking, there is an opportunity for every gaming company to push all the work related to text, or 95% of the work related to the text upstream to fix things before they get to the LQA stage with the right process, right? And this is usually where most of the creative work is being done, right? So we see this a lot. Once it's out to LQA, if everything has been done right, the other aspects of quality come into play and become crucial to, to watch out for, because guess what? There's just no way to detect them when you're purely staring at your source text and your translation text. No matter how creative it is, you'll never be able to spot the issue that Bass was talking about, right? So if you don't know where it appears on screen, your toast, right? You can have the text perfect, but nobody will see it. So we need two to tango, right? We need different aspects of quality playing together, usually more than two. Mm -hmm. Which it is, you know, why content context matters so much. Mm -hmm. Linguists need to know the context to be able to, to write appropriately. You can't just go with the source text always. Yeah. 
earlier you guys mentioned um, the feedback loop between like end users and vendors and so on. Um, so how would you say that the roles of um, of vendor managers and quality managers like overlap or how do they work together? Hmm. I can comment on that because we work with both quality teams and vendor teams at Content Quo. Uh, and it's it's actually quite funny because uh, every organization is a little bit different. And we see some organizations where the quality team is super powerful and basically has you know all the levers to manage the process. But we also see some organizations where the quality team is the most subdued and, and, and the least heard team out of them all, mm -hmm. right? And maybe vendor management reigns supreme and quality is just subordinate to everybody else, but cannot really make any change. So I, I think it's a core, the core aspect of this is a culture of the organization, right? How serious are we about quality of our translation, the quality of our service, the quality of our games, right? And what are we willing to do? What kind of processes, what kind of teams and relations between teams we have to put in place in order to achieve those goals? And some organizations, let me tell you, are clearly doing a better job at that than the others. Tricky, tricky relationship, tricky balance. Uh, but like before, you need to, to tango, right? It's not about choosing between quality management or vendor management. They overlap, but you have to have both if mm -hmm. you really want to run a successful translation organization, commercially or you know otherwise. Mm -hmm. You know, to piggyback on that, somebody uh, used a, a great word. We were having a conversation about this, and they said... Uh, you know, their philosophy of vendor management, and, and I really appreciated this, was to empower the vendor. Empower the vendor to really own the content, own the language, um, own the style guidance, own the term bases, um, and, and put that accountability on them, um, as well as bringing in a third party to hold that accountability of quality metrics to them. Um, and I, I love that because when you're, you know, a lot of enterprise organizations work with really lean localization teams. Uh, we'll be honest, Localization is often an afterthought in, in product development, um, and oftentimes these teams are running really slim operations. So I, I, I love just the term empowering the vendor and, and putting that accountability on them, uh, particularly when it comes to the scale um, and being able to scale a quality program and a vendor management program without necessarily having to put a lot of heads on the, on, on the role. Yeah, I think coming from the, the vendor point of view, I can, uh, add some of, some of the other side on that and I think Elena touched on it at the start as well when saying like you've got to put it into your planning phase and agree up front what, uh, what, what quality is. Um, where it gets a little bit more complicated is that there might be several vendors um, working at different uh, phases along so when we would be taking LQA for example for keywords it could be possible that keywords did the translations and we would be doing the LQA and that would be a completely um, different department and I would even say that keywords would have been harsher on the translations if keywords did it because we would want to you know make sure we didn't appear to be kind of bigging up the other side and yet at the same time we might be held by the, the client and um, might think that we're hiding to you know help out the keywords translations um, and at the same time if you're critical of someone else's translations like you know it, be it whoever else that maybe did the translations, then it looks like you're maybe trying to win the business. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a little bit of back and forth uh, and give it that. But I, I suppose as the vendor, you know that you're ultimately responsible, um, especially if you've been given that accountability and you're kind of aware of it. But ultimately, if, if you do fail on the quality um, and you say, okay, well, the expectations were wrong, well, it was also up to you to manage those expectations. So I think um, it kind of does come down to 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 you in the end if, if it goes wrong and and I've been there and had to to take on some of those harsh uh, criticisms and and I guess you, you kind of learn from that and that's that yeah. continual feedback loop and then you go again mm. yeah absolutely and I think you know vendor relationships and, and client vendor relationships it should be a partnership uh, I I 
you know, on the agency side, I want to be a consultant and a partner to my clients and, and work with them and collaborate on defining those metrics and what quality is. And, and that also helps me get a much better understanding of the scope I'm working with and, and the specifications I need to meet. William, I liked your comments too on scaling. Um, because you think about vendor management and the vendor management function. So you've got your production, your production process, which is how you're producing the actual content. And then van vendor management is a process that feeds into the production process, right? So it's something that all of a sudden you've got this really, you've planned out this great production process and now you're going to start inputting people into that process. So when you're thinking about, first of all, onboarding vendors, for every vendor that you invite to your uh, organization to start a screening process, immediately once you invite them, you are making administrative time investments in that candidate. So if you haven't strategically decided on what are the characteristics of the candidate that I'm looking for, what are the subject fields I need them to know, what's the minimum education that I want them to have, what's the what's the language, um, A language, B language requirements that I have, dialects that I, if you don't have that, if you haven't decided on that upfront, there's a chance that you're inputting people into the process and wasting your own time screening people that you could have easily determined from the start shouldn't have been input into the process at all. On top of that, if you happen to get, and here's the thing too, when screening from a vendor management perspective, so the screening, uh, the screening process for vendor management that I would typically go through would include first inviting the candidate, requesting documents from them so I can check and see if it looks like they're a good fit for the work. Then I would do a due diligence review where I check, can they handle the data properly that I'm giving them? I'm giving them highly confidential data of my clients. Do they have processes in place to protect that data so it's not being leaked all over the place? Okay, once they can prove that, I'm gonna put them through linguistic testing. By this point, I've invested about 10 hours in the person and now I'm gonna start paying an editor to review their work. So I've invested maybe about $200, $300 in this candidate and the longer I work with the candidate, I'm going to grow to like them because I'm a human being and I like other human beings that I talk to. So it's going to get harder and harder the farther they get down the process to say, nope, you're no longer a good fit. So it's really, really important at the very front to have strong screening requirements so that you prevent people from getting all the way downstream. And importantly, somehow making it into your process and starting to populate your highly valuable translation memories with content I mean, it just blows my mind, all of the organizations that don't have good TMs in the age of training machine translation, that don't have good TMs because they didn't take the time to get the best vendors that they could have gotten populating that TM. And now they're not in a position to join the, the market when it comes to MT. So it's being able to see how are all of these different pieces related and how can I have a return on investment in the time that I'm putting, putting into uh, selecting the vendors that I'm working with. Mm-hmm. Oh, That's really thanks, Elena. Uh, I, I really like how you describe the the the, the crucial uh, onboarding and screening process. In Content World, we've helped a bunch of companies do that. And I think the, the motto that we've seen work best is um, actually a proverb uh, um, that, that we use here quite a bit. It's called trust, but verify. So William talked about empowering your language service partners, and this is a great idea. But once you get to real scale, once you get to, you know, putting your business on the line, if you're an LSP, for instance, you know, outsourcing the work to other smaller LSPs or to individuals, and you're actually making money, you're making profit from that, it's not enough to empower anymore. You, you need to have some guarantees in place that this empowerment will actually produce adequate results. So this goes for onboarding new partners, right, and linguists, uh, and using data to make sure that you're not just growing attached to them personally because you like, I don't know, the, the profile picture they used on their CV, but actually looking at the translations they produce on a regular basis, trying to quantify how they are doing in terms of compliance with those quality requirements and doing this over and over again many many times in a economical fashion and uh, in a fashion that produces consistent data that you can rely upon for decision making and avoid those very very human biases that elena was talking about so yeah trust but verify 
need to make sure you actually know what's going on in there. And the only real way to do that is with data that's collected in a proper fashion is desubjectivized, stored, aggregated, and analyzed regularly so that the right decisions can be made, no matter how difficult they are from a personal standpoint. So this is what we've seen really work at scale. Yeah, trust, but very high. Mm. We have this big question here of, you know, how can you then actually scale translation quality? And Elena, you know, has started on this with um, with screening, proper screening processes. And Carol, you mentioned this now as well. Um, mm. What else comes to mind for all of you when you think about how do you actually scale translation quality? Terminology management. Terminology management. Terminology management. Yeah, that's a good point. Terminology management is key. Noted. <laughs> um, you know, I think I think uh, another it, it gets you know you can get in the debate of of you know do we onboard um, a single vendor to handle everything or do we bring on freelancers or do we bring on multiple vendors a two vendor model. Um, I think the question of what the best way to scale is is really it just depends on the organization, the the um, the the maturity of the program, um, and the resources at hand. I think are are some elements that are really necessary to to assess and determine where you're at before you decide what what approach to take. Um, but I I loved the um, oh what was the the yeah the terminology management of having having strong um, a, a strong base of terms, uh, strong style guidance, and and strong specifications of how to, how to handle dates, currencies, um, metric conversions, um, and all of that really well defined and and available for the linguists. I think is is a key part. I think quality yeah. at source is oh, bad. Go ahead. Sorry, thank you. Yeah, I think quality at source is probably. One of, one of the ones that's it's really mm -hmm. simple and basic, but I think as you go and scale everything that's a simpler issue that matters for every project, it's going to cost more and it's going to be easier if you've invested in quality at source. And I, I think that's, um, Elena touched on it again as well, uh, um, when saying how companies have not invested in their term base and, and this kind of thing. And that, you know, in the age of MT and, and looking to, to get rid of one of the steps along the process, you really have to spend the money up front and take the time to get things right early in the process because it's just going to cost so much more and be so much more difficult to do it later. And the more scale there is to that, the harder it is again. Right. Well, this is just perfect. Uh, I'm super happy that you brought up the 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 source uh, quality topic. <laughs> Uh, this is so funny because at, at Content Quo, we've been talking about quality at source uh, since at least 2016. And I think only this year I've actually started to meet teams that do something about it as opposed to talking about it. So that's a crucial distinction I think uh, we all need to keep in mind, right? When it comes to quality management and scaling, right? Uh, there's so many moving parts. Terminology is a key component, right? It's it's one of the core requirements to shaping this high quality translation, right? Uh, quality at source, great component, very important, very high impact, high leverage, if you can manage to do it right. Uh, what I wanted to say is going back to this same trust but verify principle. Requirements are great, but you also need a way to ensure that they are actually being complied with, right? So unfortunately, it's never enough just to specify and then hope or keep your fingers crossed that it will work out. Unfortunately, at scale, it never does. And things start to break despite your best intention. So if there were one silver bullet, I would say, to you know, quality and scaling is uh, this trust but verify principle yes you need to get the basics straight and out the requirements laid down but then you need to be constantly vigilant either with your own team or by outsourcing this or just finding any other way getting end user feedback to make sure you know whether your great requirements are actually being implemented in translation production processes and of course technology helps a bit um We've done some pretty crazy stuff at Content Quo about scaling quality programs, so I know the limits of that. 
easily going up by a factor of 10 is possible with technology, but it's just one component out of 10 that you really need to build up a scalable program. So that's that. One thing we worked on too to, to contribute to scaling our quality management was automating context capture using SDKs and such for the products. Um, that way Linguist had in context, um, uh, that all the source language was in context and they were able to translate with just the UI right in front of them of, of what that would look like. And we found that reduced errors, it reduced queries, it reduced um, just the back and forth time it took and allowed us to really scale um, how we managed quality and, and make it a bit more proactive, um, which was helpful. Mm -hmm. I think this is what Bass was saying about taking quality upstream. Great example, William. I agree, and that's the terminology management. That's the terminology management piece to it, because you think about William was saying about queries. So if you don't have a term base up front and you have a job that's going into 20 different languages and there's a concept that's ambiguous, you're going to have 20 translators asking a project manager, what does this concept mean? Why wouldn't you define the concept on the front end, send it out to the people so that they, you don't have to waste your project manager's time answering the same question over and over? There's a really great TechCom study that states that, I think it was, I can't remember what it was done, maybe like 2009 or 2010, but most, and this was for the technical space, for technical authoring and writing, but for organizations, it was a really, it was a hilarious survey of um, probably about 1,500 different um, people who work in organizations that technical authoring and about 90% of them thought that their processes could improve with terminology management and about 10% of them actually had terminology management. So uh, so it's funny to hear you say people talking since 2016 and it takes four years to finally address the issue. It's the same thing oh. in our industry too. We don't have, we don't have a consistent terminology that we're using within our specification. So in Europe, the term, according to ISO 17100, you've got your translator, reviser, reviewer. In the US, we're using translator, editor, proofreader, but they're not, they don't, they're not concepts that align. So every time I have a client and they say, I would like a revision, I can't say, okay, I know what that is because we're all using the terminology consistently. I have to actually say, okay, well, what's revision to you? Revision to me means this. What does revision mean? And so it's like all of a sudden you have to have this 10, 15 minute conversation about first defining what does this mean? Whereas if we all just use consistent terminology, I'd say it's perfectly natural, though, that we're not using consistent terminology with, from, a, from a terminological standpoint. Uh, when language and when industries are young, there's a period of like leveling out with terminology where it's just perfectly natural that the language use, it's just idiolect. People are experimenting with how to talk about things. And eventually, over time, that harmonizes into a standardized terminology being adopted by an industry in order to have more efficient communication. We're not there yet. And so I think that's an important thing to be aware of when defining specifications. Yeah, you might want to rush through this, but guess what? Our terms are not consistent. So you might want to take some time first to actually figure out what do these terms mean to people. That's such a good point. And one thing that we were challenged with is separate from you know industry and standard terminology, or the industry standardization of terminology, um, internal terminology just with our products and tools and how we're naming things, our naming conventions. Um, you know, every every day it felt like uh, marketing or product was changing a product name that maybe didn't work in certain regions and it never got ran by the globalization team uh, or or went towards any of the in-country ambassadors or, or whatnot. So yeah, creating that consistency in terminology, making sure that all functions, all all sides of the industry, um, whatever that we're re referring terminology towards um, is on the same page. I think is crucial. I like that you you touched on like the natural idiocracy of it. I think you've seen that loads of times as well, where you can tell a translator has has maybe asked a query and and not had the query responded, maybe in a, in a hurry or something, and and the advice they got is use your best guess. And, and it kind of takes me back to when I was saying that when you're doing LQA, language is only one of the, the necessary uh, attributes because you'll see um, something like uh, something that's ambiguous. I don't know, uh, board was translated as a, a notice board because it was just one word and actually it was a board meeting or a board of directors or something like that. And what you'll see is maybe the Spanish tester has said, oh, I, I see what's happened here and they'll flag it to the whole team and now you'll get a fix for 20 people 
for 20 languages from one person who doesn't speak the other language and you know maybe some of them even got it right because they their best guess was a different guess <laughs> so i think yeah it's just it's it's really clear that there's time taken um william as you were saying that there was a tool that, that allowed translators to see everything in context and that just sounds beautiful because it, it just kind of um alleviates you know some of the effort that it takes for for a pm to come back on all these queries when there's maybe a, a huge query tracker and then maybe they've missed one and the, well they'll probably get it right and and then as you say elena that the pm i mean is that really the best use of the, the pm's time to answer the same question to you know maybe they're dealing with 20 different vendors for each of the language and you know is, is it really the best use of their time to um, to be answering everyone directly and maybe they just share a note hey we didn't get an answer for this everyone please use your best guess Mm. Uh, so this is one place where technology can definitely help make things a bit more effective. Um, uh, for Elena, I wanted to offer a slightly different take on this uh, revision versus editing conundrum. Uh, one of the best practices I've seen work really well in those kind of specification contexts or defining what kind of quality is required uh, seems to be moving away from the process of producing the translation and focusing more on the properties of the result. So what's your tolerance towards accuracy errors? What's your tolerance towards terminology errors, right? Uh, it looks like Elena has actually dropped out all of a sudden. That's a shame. I can still uh, hear you. Oh, you're still here. This is awesome. Yeah. So yeah, basically, if we start from those specifications about what attributes of the translation are more important versus the others, we as translation professionals can actually suggest the right process of getting there to the customer. But if we start from the process and try to align our expectations using process terminology, it already starts to get very difficult simply because of the terminologies themselves. And then figuring out the right quality level is again, an elusive goal. So if you guys have any thoughts about that, that would be awesome. I can still hear you all. I'm, my, my camera's just loading or something. Cool. Okay. Does anyone want to jump in on, um, on that? Yeah, you know, I, I think, uh, Kirill, if I if I understood correctly, you're 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 saying um, define the end result that we're looking for and kind of plan backwards from there. Correct. Correct. So focus on the end result and how that is supposed to feel like. Right? What are the quality attributes I would like to achieve, and then build the process that was a certain cost because there is a cost to actually achieving certain levels of quality and with a certain process gets you, you know, in a reliable and repeatable and scalable way to those requirements you have defined, right? Quality doesn't come for um, free. This is why we need revision. This is why we need LQA, but maybe sometimes we can optimize certain of the steps to do them in certain ways that can get us to the right quality level, maybe are a lower investment. So that's the key balance, right? The cost of quality and the right level of quality and how to adapt one to the other, starting from the, the quality level as the, the starting point and not from the process, which can really lead us very far away from hitting the right goal for the end user, for the buyer, for another LSP upstream or for an internal customer like Buzz's team in LQA versus uh, his uh, his friends in translation teams. So this are uh, some of the things that I've seen over the years. Yeah, I think it stresses the importance of people as well and getting that kind of training right. It, even just in terms of like you were saying, like trust but verify. You know, when I started, maybe it was 13 years I was at Keyword. So when I started, it was like 30 people and someone is the expert. And when you question their opinion on that language or what's happening, maybe there's a, an initial bit of offense. Whereas when I left, uh, nobody felt like that. I mean, it was natural that you should question everything. I mean, it's an ana analytical point of view that you need and you need to be able to, you know, engage in that feedback loop. And, and it's so important that all of those elements are kind of trained in. And, and it's just, it highlights to me just constantly where we would come back to the, the importance of having good people around and, and smart people will get it right and they will learn and they will change their habits accordingly. And, you know, I think that kind of fits into 
to what you were saying as well, Kirill. In a way, it does. Uh, there's another saying I had in mind. In God we trust, all others please bring data. So yeah, <laughs> I think at scale it's a bit less about the individuals that we have and more about the process that we built, which those people are then part of, and the data points that we can use to help those people comply with the right process. Whereas at the start, like you said, a 30, 30 person company, this is where you have to go the, the people way, right? But unfortunately, there's a limit to how much that could actually scale. And I've seen very few exceptions from this rule, unfortunately. So yeah, with scale comes structure, comes process, comes specific requirements, and yeah, quite a bit of cost behind all of it, but you need a predictable result. So what, what can you do? Mm -hmm. When we talk about scaling, oftentimes that's where um, like automation comes in. So specifically in, in, in scaling translation quality, how would companies use automation in a way that doesn't reduce or even harm translation quality? And hopefully even make it you know more efficient you know um i think we can or i can touch on this a little bit some some areas i have found automation um really can bolster quality is looking at what are what are the organization's internationalization processes um and how are their teams internationalizing and what tools are they using to automate that process because no engineer is really thinking it seems about internationalization and um knows always what to look for so deploying tools like uh, lingo ports globalizer that can create an automated um basic basically an audit of of an engineer's code before them or as they merge it into the branch and and flag internationalization errors that they can proactively address before it even reaches the translation team um, or or uh, mobile sdks for ios and android uh, context capturing that can feed into a tool what's an example uh, smartling has uh, context views um, so feed into a tool and and that the linguist can then work in in their cat tool and, and see the context right in front of them um, as well as just automating the translation process um, if if you know the volumes within an sla just automate automating kickoff dates and 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 timeline assignments to the steps um, can take a lot of work off certain pms backs and and allow them to focus more on on other tasks <clears throat> such as further automating um a lot of manual tasks and and um working with linguists and local teams to to learn insights and continue building that those quality metrics mm -hmm. right i would be uh, remiss if i didn't mention you can do all that with word b <laughs> <laughs> just good saying. job Robert. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to chime in from the content call perspective. So William was talking about things that can happen, let's say, upstream if you're a localization buyer team. And, you know, there are certain things that only your team can do, like pushing the internationalization forward. We usually see it like either the boundary between the buyers and the LSPs or inside the LSP supply chain. And there, there's even more potential for automating the quality programs. Uh, what we've seen still in 2020 is that Microsoft Excel is the name of the game and it's terribly inefficient to scale most processes with Microsoft Excel. Let me tell you that. I was just doing an ROI calculation for a prospect this morning and the horrible numbers we had uh, were uh, very clear. So yeah, if you want to kill the scalability of any process, just try to build it on top of Microsoft Excel. I guarantee you get the worst results ever. If you want to fix it, there might be some specialized solutions for the certain part of the workflow you're looking to automate. That's that's very clear. But don't automate too early, right? That's uh, another problem that we've seen. Until you have the core system in place, like Warby, for instance, right? There is no point in going either downstream or upstream. You need to keep your core fit, and this is an absolute prerequisite for automating further. So this is why content will often say no to teams that don't have a TMS in place or don't have it sufficiently deployed. Too early, right? We cannot help. So it's important to be conscious of the stage uh, what, that your company is at in terms of automation and do the right thing every time. First things first. Mm -hmm.
yeah be aware yeah, of I think that's a great oh sorry can you all see me by the way i can see you all now but i okay yes, you're back. I yes. That, um when it comes to scaling to and, and trying to build automation into processes you have to be very aware of dependencies so iso 9001 is a great certification to have because it gives you um the it, it prepares you to participate in ongoing cycles of plan do check act and it gives you the strategies to to say no first i'm going to really um really find what i want to automate first because there's all these dependencies so let's say you say i'm going to try to automate five things at once and then downstream something happens you have a really hard time figuring out what was the origin of this um whatever got messed up downstream because too much automation was tried to put in place at the start so it's it's taking a small subset too and having being it really controlled about it and just saying i'm going to tweak this one little thing let's see what happens on a small subset and once i can guarantee that it works i'm going to deploy that to the to the larger organization or structure team absolutely yeah, best way to manage any harm. change move in small steps do no harm and make sure you get the benefits you were expecting right that's why at content quo we always start with a pilot project limited scope limited team members and so on and so forth right want to make sure that you know benefit can be added and, and and not removed so probably best way for any sufficiently large organization any process mm -hmm. all right guys we are running out of time um oh. but <laughs> unfortunately uh but if any of you have any last comments um or things you want to share with our audience and if the audience has any questions like uh sometimes we get a lot of questions like we we have a good audience there today um but sometimes we get a lot of questions and sometimes we don't you know sometimes people are just like really listening and in tune with, with uh, what people are saying but uh you know if anyone in the audience wants to ask a good question now is your time you have these uh these four people four super experts here so it's a good time to ask a question if you want to <laughs> In the meantime, well, you're waiting. closing remarks, yeah. <laughs> yeah, wait for the questions. What's the worst problem with translation quality that you guys have seen recently? What really got your hair to stand up when you discovered what was wrong with that translation? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I just think about the the examples that come up for me are examples that I always start my class. I start the localization project management class I teach with, and they're examples of just human bi uh, human bias being um, perpetuated by MT. Because I think something we kind of forget too is that MT, like people kind of separate the human authoring, like the human language. People think MT is just like, oh, ha ha ha, bad quality MT. It's like, no, that's based on human language, and it's perpetuating human biases. So like there's examples I give of a Palestinian man who was arrested in um, in the Middle East for uh, an NT machine translation of him saying good morning was translated as like attack them or something like that. So he ended up being arrested and and there's just like really bad examples of this of gender bias being perpetuated through machine translation. And so it's just like hey there's there's human language underneath here that we got to be aware of that's a great right. point yeah like social bias and yeah. artificial intelligence is uh it's it's a serious thing we need we need to start looking at now and it's too bad linguists weren't more involved with mt um from the start because we probably could have that's it's kind of it's too bad that there was such a separation between the folks doing the development that were so reactive in this industry that like engineers who have no background in translation or divine or designing MT systems without the um without the advice and recommendations of linguists who could have maybe helped them identify some of these things and say um yeah we might want to clean up this before we're doing that and so it's always just a matter of reacting and going and cleaning up messes that have been previously made unfortunately or it's i shouldn't say always it seems like often it is i think that's partially uh hindsight though right because uh I think. Yeah. Sorry, Carol. Now go ahead, Buzz. Sorry. Yeah, I think maybe it's it's with the benefit of hindsight because I think at the time maybe linguists didn't really want to to go down the MTE route. It's not That's really. True. Um, That's true. That's point. In line with so the direction. That to new tech. Like, yeah. hey, you're trying to steal my job. 
Um, yeah. I think only only now, well, maybe the last two or three years, um, people have really got on board a bit more. Uh, that's that's been my perception anyway within the, the industry. Yeah. Do we have any questions? No, no. See. The audience is is just blown away, and uh, <laughs> don't have any <laughs> questions. A lot of brands. Yeah, they really have. Okay. Maybe they so, trust it. Uh, now they're verifying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah, Everybody is now yeah, trying to figure out a way of how to verify what they've been <laughs> buying or translating so far. If that's the only thing you guys get out of my contribution, I would be a happy man. Trust, <laughs> but verify. Right. That's the mantra oh, that would. Right. It's an excellent <laughs> mantra. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. But we don't want to keep you any longer. Um, this has been a fantastic conversation and thanks so much to all of you for coming on and joining us today and thanks to our listeners um, for, for joining in on, on this event as well. It's been, it's been a great talk and um, yeah, have a nice day, evening, wherever you are. Awesome discussions. Looking forward to do it again sometime soon. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. bye, William, if you can still hear us. Yeah, bye.